Hey, everybody. So one of the most common answers to my genie question on this podcast is I wish there were more ways to get great seats for less money. Well, get this. Last Thursday, we put Getting the Band Back Together tickets on sale, and we made the best seats in the house available to you for only 50 bucks. That's right. Get orchestra seats for 50 bucks. but you, here's the catch. You got to get them by this Wednesday. Go to gettingthebandbacktogether.com or visit my blog and get $50 tickets to my new Broadway musical today. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. This is Ken Davenport. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. And please welcome to the show... Broadway, off-Broadway director Trip Coleman. Welcome, Trip. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So just last season, Trip had two shows on Broadway with the terrific Six Degrees of Separation. I was a big fan of that Thank show. Thank you. Uh, as well as Significant Other. Uh, and this season, he'll have Lobby Hero on Broadway as well. He just told me he was in pre-production for that before we started rolling tape. He's worked extensively off-Broadway everywhere from Second Stage, MTC, MCC, all the M's, playwrights, and on and on and on. So tell us, you grew up in the city, is that right? Yeah, I was born and raised here. So what was the first... New York City theatrical experience you had? Well, the, I, I suppose the very, very first was uh, my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Bazzarini, uh, happened to, he was my homeroom teacher, but he also happened to be a graduate of the Yale School of Drama for playwriting. So at the school that I went to every Friday, each sort of homeroom would be in charge of the assembly and the entertainment for the assembly. And if you were in Mr. Bazzarini's class, you always got to do like this amazing play that he would write for the class. And he wrote for us the, the story of the founding of Rome, how um, Romulus and Remus uh, were these uh, twins who were abandoned by their mother on the Tiber. And they floated down the river on like this thatched uh, basket and were found and raised by wolves. And that's sort of the, the, the story of the founding of Rome. Anyway, I played their mother. And... Uh, I borrowed my sister's Cabbage Patch Kid dolls and wept as I, you know, released my two babies into the river and uh, was hooked. I was like, ah, I love theater. <laughs> I heard you were very good in that, actually. I, I slayed. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> First of all, any uh, sitcom writers out there, Mr. Bazzarini's class sounds like a, sit- like a Yale graduate writing place. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Sounds yeah. like head of the class, actually, that, that sitcom. <laughs> uh, so how did you go from... Weeping on a Cabbage Patch kid to uh, actual career in the theater. So I think like the other thing that was amazing about growing up in New York was that my parents, like all like good liberal Jewish parents, you know, took me to the theater like other parents take their kids to, you know, church. And so I saw, like as a kid, I, growing up, I saw the original production of Angels in America, and I saw, you know, the original production of Falsettos, and the original production of Love, Valor, Compassion, and all these sort of, and Six Degrees of Separation for that matter, and all these sort of landmark shows where as I was also growing up and like kind of figuring out I was a gay kid and stuff like that, it was like hugely important for me to see myself represented back to me on stage, and, and I thought that that was so, so such a powerful experience, and it was such a boon for me and a way for me to to kind of like accept who I was that I felt like that was what I wanted to do for a living and help others in some way. So so that's sort of how I stumbled into it. And I d- did a lot of acting. And then my senior year of high school, my drama teacher was like, you seniors, if you want to, you can direct a one act. And I'd never directed before. And everyone else chose these like very tidy little plays. And I chose Cowboy Mouth by Sam Shepard and Patti Smith, which um, was created by them uh, over a period of time when they just locked themselves in a hotel room in London, did a lot of drugs and passed typewriter back and forth between the two of them. And so like the teacher was like, okay, if that's what you want to do. And he put my, my show at the end of the program and had a disclaimer before that, like if anyone's offended by, you know, sexual situations or strong language, you can leave. And, you know, I thought like being such a provocateur, it was like really like, I don't know, I was hooked from that too. And then, so I went to school, I went to Yale for undergraduate and did a, a lot of directing right off the bat as well as acting. And then for a couple of years out of, out of undergrad, I was still acting and then decided I was a far better director than I was an actor. And I also just was so sort of fed up with being directed by directors who didn't, who I thought I could do a better job than they, than they did. And I, I assisted a bunch uh, during that time. I assisted Joe Mantello and Mike Nichols and then went to, went to grad school also at Yale and then was very lucky that like I got my big break. My first job out of school was a, a play called The Last Sunday in June by a writer named John Toll. 
Collins, who um, people probably know from Buyer and Seller. Uh, anyway, so that show was at Rattlestick and then transferred to a commercial production. And so I kind of like got lucky that my first show was uh, something that got attention, you know? Got lucky that I got a first show. <laughs> I want to go back to that moment where you said, oh, I knew at the, I knew I would be better director than I was an actor. Yeah. Because that is a crucial moment, I think, in so many people's lives. Yeah. Have you... If you hadn't come to that realization, you might be a very frustrated actor at this moment in your life. Well, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure you'll ever meet any actor who's not a frustrated actor. <laughs> but I, I think, like ultimately, it wasn't just that I was like sort of re- realized I was like sort of mediocre as an actor, which I sort of was. But like it was more than that. It was like it was about uh, I wanted. I, I was more interested in in the sort of macro. Pay. I think as an actor, what's so extraordinary is that you are so inside of your character and you're so fully invested in in bringing to life this this one fully bringing to life this one aspect of the show and I was I think I was always more interested in like all the aspects and I think collaborating with designers and actors and writers and everyone involved in the theater I think like that was really what was most intoxicating for me and I think I just like always had like a kind of a directorial eye even as an actor I would always like be blocking myself you know what I mean (laughs) which probably drove those directors completely crazy (laughs) I literally before we started this podcast said to Tripp oh I'm not going to get all Barbara Walters on you don't worry about it but you said something very specifically about growing up in the city and seeing original shows like Love Valor and Angels and coming to terms with your own sexuality at the time yeah were your parents taking you to these plays or were you seeing them on your own no they were totally taking me to these plays so and did you know you were gay then did they know I mean I don't know it was like sort of I don't know I think I probably always knew but I didn't know (laughs) Um, and so again when I'm trying to figure out exactly what to name myself or how to identify myself it was really helpful to have these these examples shown to me from the stage do you know what I mean and but I think like my parents were just like really they were really into theater as you know like they were like you know good liberal Jewish New Yorkers who like you know when we went on the weekends to our, our place in Stamford in Connecticut they would you know play the Les Mis soundtrack on cassette in the car you know what I mean it was like that it was very it was very much like a part of our our, our growing up that we would go to the theater constantly so your process now, you were talking about uh, you, you had a director's eye, which is collaborating with designers, etc. Mm. Tell me about your, when you get a play, what is the first thing you do? I'm gonna, you're going to direct this play. What's the first bit of your process? I think it really varies play to play, but I think one thing I I'm almost always do is I'm very musical. So one thing I always do is I make a playlist. I make a playlist of songs that, for whatever reason, inspire me or make me think of certain situations in the play or certain characters in the play or certain feelings or moods that the play evokes. And I listen to that that sound, that sort of, whatever, mixtape, as it were, constantly as I read and reread and reread play. And sometimes those those pieces of music end up being in the play and sometimes they totally don't but it's a kind of for me it's almost like a meditative way into into sort of feeling the world of the play but i think the most important thing like whether it's a musical or a play is like i think really getting getting in a in a very intimate way uh, involved with the um playwright or the composer as it were and really getting inside trying to get inside their head and and, and understand what they were what they were thinking or 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 even if it's a totally subconscious act on their part, like just discussing the play, what, what what things come up for them, what things come up for me, and seeing whether we are simpatico or whether things that I hadn't realized or thought of or, uh, or had occurred to me are, are occurring to them. And sort of, I think that that conversation is, I think, one of the more delightful ones. And that's, and that's, I mean, and then and then you have the most delightful conversations of all, which are with designers. I mean, to me, the designers are the greatest dramaturgs of plays. Mm-hmm. They are able to see deep structure and themes and mysteries about the play in a way that I don't think anyone else can. And I think it's, like, to me, those conversations when I sit down with a designer to start the process of designing play are amongst the most, most fruitful. So can you give me an example of a set designer that gave you some dramaturgical insight on how that, <laughs> on Six Degrees, for example? Sure. Well, that, I mean, that was, that was a very prolonged process. We, we spent almost two years working on that design, partly because 
we threw out our first design almost entirely. And what made you throw it out? Partly, I think John Guare was like, I love you guys, but this no. is not the design. And we were like, okay, great. And I think, I think he was right. You know, I think, I think it was overly complicated initially. But I think like with that play, I brought an observation about the play to bear in my conversations with, with Mark in that to me, the play has a kind of fascinating structure because it's almost Aristotelian for the first section where they're all at a dinner party and it's all contained action inside of one location in more or less real time. And then there's an act that happens. There's this homosexual act that happens in the play that then causes the structure of the play to like kind of blow up and fracture. And all of a sudden you're leaping across time and space and a million locations and going backwards and forwards and flashbacks and all that kind of stuff and fragments of, of snippets of things and imagined scenes and everything like that. So that sort of the unity and the structure of what you had been living in via this sort of transgressive act that the main character stumbles upon kind of blows the whole play up. And I think that mirrors her own Weeza, the main character's her own kind of journey through the play and that she is in this kind of, she's inured to her life. She is kind of asleep at the wheel and then coming into contact with this young kid kind of brings her into a keen awareness of all the, the falsities in her own life that she is upholding. And so sort of the challenge I, I gave to Mark was, can you follow that structure? Can, in other words, can you build something that looks solid and of a, uh, of, of a kind of, of a, that has, has wholeness to it and then explode it? And so that's sort of where the, the design started from, that, as, as an example. And what was on the Six Degrees playlist? <laughs> there was a lot of mute. Well, I, I mean, the play takes place in like 1989 to 1991, say. So it was really exactly the same time that I was a teenager. So for me, the playlist was all about what I was listening to as an angsty teenager because I really related to all those kids in the play who were so in so much pain and so so angry at their parents. And so there was a lot of Smiths and Cure and the Pixies and you know a lot of like all of the alternative music that I was listening to, punk music that I was listening to in my in my new order and uh, in my bedroom as I was, you know, raging. And so yeah, the, I mean the the production st- and that's an instance where the playlist made it into the production because the, the the show started with a New Order song and ended with a Cure song. So, and Sonic Youth. Sonic Youth was on that playlist too, for sure. You do a <laughs> lot of new plays. So what makes you decide you want to do a specific play? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's like a little bit um, ineffable. I think there is, I think as I sort of mature as an artist, the the sort of the archest answer to that question would be like, if it scares me, you know, if I'm, if I'm terrified and I don't know how to do it, then I think it's probably a good idea that I do it. But <laughs> if you'd asked me that same question like a 10 years ago, I think it would be like, oh, I read the play and I immediately had a visceral connection to it and or or I was besotted by one of the characters or I was, I've been in love with the writer for many, many years or I just could see the play immediately in my head. But I think actually now, when I have a hard time seeing a play as I'm visualizing a play as I'm reading it, that doesn't necessarily mean that like it's not for me. It just means that I have to like I have to find a a different way in. And what do you think makes a great play versus a great movie or a great novel? Like when you, when you read a play for the first time, is there like, Oh yeah, the, I can do something with this as opposed to, ah, they should just put it in a film. (laughs) That's a great question. I think, I think part of it is, is the, is that theater is, it feels to me like the last medium left wherein you are coming into a room with a group of strangers and being told and participating in the telling of a story communally. And you are, unlike, you know, like going to a museum and looking at a painting, in, in that scenario, you have the freedom to look away and walk away from what you're looking at. What's sort of amazing about theater is like you get trapped in your seat for like, you know, let's say an hour of the first act and an hour of the second act. And like you're trapped there in the dark. And that's kind of an intense experience, too, to, to sort of in our in our, you know, in our digital age of like being able to click through channels and, you know, 
you're not allowed to do that in the theater. You have to kind of sit there and, and, and let the experience wash over you. So to me, that's like such a sacred responsibility as a theater maker to make sure that like every moment counts and that, that I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to lose my audience's attention. So I think that's sort of what makes it special. I think, yeah, again, even with movies, like I guess in the theater, you're, you're sitting there, but they're, they're not with you, right? The actors, they're still, they're on the screen. And then if you're watching stuff at home, you can always pause and go make some popcorn for yourself or whatever. But in the theater, you can't do that. You're like literally are trapped <laughs> in an uncomfortable comfortable seat where your knees are touching the seat in front of you <laughs> you know what i mean so you gotta make it good because it's like you're, you're stuck there as an audience member in the rehearsal room itself once you get into that room you talked about oh i used to block myself yeah do you i've always curious about how directors work like the night before you have a rehearsal for act two scene four yeah are you sketching out like oh this is where eric goes this right. way or right is it right. just get everyone in a room and just walk wherever you want to walk well, I think it's evolved over the years. Mike Nichols once said to me, like, the, what you do is you prepare like crazy. You spend months preparing. And then the day before the first rehearsal, you throw it all away. And you walk in as if you've never encountered the play ever before. Which I thought was really great advice. Because, like, everything you'd worked on will still be there. But you also have to be completely alive to whatever impulses are going to be in the room from the actors, from the designers, uh, from the playwright. And so you have to be flexible and amenable to what's going on in the moment. And so I find that if I overthink something or if I over -block, or pre block something and stuff like that, it'll feel dead within minutes of doing it. And, you know, as good as an idea that I have is, there may be a better idea that comes from the room that I don't, that I don't want to negate. Do you know? But I also have a, a very, very, very good blocking technique that I use that I will, it's a secret, but I will, I will, I will share it with you. Please. And I actually, first. I learned it from Adam Rapp, a playwright that, and a director who I, who I work with. A, and then he, he had learned it from the great, 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 great playwright and director, Mike Lee, British director and playwright. Anyway, so this is what you do. You know, you're, you do your table work. And then for the first day you're on your feet, you have, I read it. So I read every single line of dialogue and every single stage direction and I don't look up at all and the actors put their books down and move through the world for the first time and what that does for the actors is it releases them from the anxiety of that first time when you're up on your feet and you don't quite know your lines yet so you're holding your book and you're checking to make sure you're saying the right thing but you're also trying to stay alive to the impulses in the air in the moment you all that anxiety is released and you're just you're just present. And for me, what a, for the director, what it does is it releases you from all of your organizing impulses, like all of your impulses to start organizing bodies and space and controlling the room, etc. You literally can't do that because you are reading. You can't even look up. You don't even see what's going on. So I do that several, several, several times, like five or six times for a scene without ever looking up. And then once the actors are like, I think we're ready to, for you to look at us, I give it to either playwright to read or to my assistant director to read. And I watch it and I start to do these little blocking adjustments to like open things up if they need to be or whatever, you know, to make it palatable for an audience. But but what what is sort of amazing about that technique is that the blocking becomes like, it's really good. <laughs> like, it, like it always is excellent blocking because it comes from the actors. You know, it comes from their, their understanding of what it's like to be in the three-dimensionality of, of the world of the play and actors love it also because it helps them memorize their lines really fast because they hear it a lot and as they're hearing it and they know oh i'm supposed to be standing at the desk when i say this line they'll remember the line because they're standing at the desk you know it's quite an amazing technique so they'll do it five or six times without actually ever speaking it'll just i would say sometimes 10 times without ever speaking the lines and then I, and then finally at the end of that exercise i give it i give them the words to say yeah it's great actors absolutely love it and so do i i love that mike nichols advice as well and actually i've heard the same thing about athletes mm. as well boxers will spend months of course training very specifically for a fight but at the end of the day they have to get in there and just totally. fight they can't think about oh here's that technique that i'm going to do right now totally. they're in the moment totally talk to me about your casting process when when actors you you like auditions i personally can't stand them so <laughs> why don't why can't you stand them i don't know i don't know if it's the tension or like i so want everyone to be so great when they walk in the room yeah, or I'm just very nice. impatient. That's nice. What is it like for you? Do you enjoy the process? So I think I, I, I enjoy it a lot, actually. I, I do I acknowledge that it is a fraught moment. It is uncomfortable because it, it is tense. It is, you know, awkward, all those things. But what I get out of it is the following. I, it's a huge opportunity for me to start hearing the play aloud because I've just been reading it to myself in my room. So that's amazing. So I get to really know the play and 
kind of hear the musicality of the play and hear what notes are the right notes and what aren't what notes aren't aren't right. And then the other thing I, I love about it is I think I think it's a mistake when directors approach auditions with their hands crossed and their an attitude of so show me what you can do to the actor. Like show me your opening night performance. To me, what an audition is is an opportunity to see whether we will like collaborating with each other. So do I like do I vibe with you and do you vibe with me? And can we can we see a world in which like we can work really, really intimately with each other. So it's, it's, I feel like, I guess the, the, the shorter answer is like, it, it also, I like it to feel like an, I'm auditioning as well. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to sell myself as a director, my ideas about the play to the actor as well. And to see if we can meet in the middle and, and collaborate. So for sense. the, for the actors that are listening out there, how does, what's the best way someone gets a call back from you? <laughs> no, that's a great question. I, I I mean I think that, you know, they have to they have to show me something about the, the character that I hadn't thought of before that dazzles me and you know, I they have to make me feel like I'd like to work with them, that I'm excited to work with them. But that's fascinating. So you don't actually want them to deliver the performance you see or hear in your head you'd rather have something no, no i don't think so i think that that would be so boring <laughs> like if i'm just if i'm just i think it would just be the most horrifying thing ever if i just all i do is have a full fully realized vision in my head and just have it it you know and just spend the rehearsal auditions and rehearsal processes making sure that that vision is completely uh, followed to the letter i think that would be brutal <laughs> When you transitioned from going from an off-Broadway director to a Broadway director, what was the biggest surprise that you felt? Well, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll say this talking to a producer. What, what was sort of most shocking to me was, like, a lot of people had, had said, oh, you know, Broadway, it's all about the bottom line, which it 100% is. But, you know, you won't feel the same way you do when you are, you know, in a production with Tim Sanford at, at Playwrights Rise in terms of like having somebody who is supporting you and who is artistically as invested as you are. And I, I had the opposite reaction. I felt like the, I was very, 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 very lucky to work with Jeffrey Richards on Significant Other and then the late, great Stuart Thompson on Six Degrees. And I, I think maybe I got spoiled because like they both were the most extraordinary, supportive, passionate advocates for, for the, those productions. And, you know, I never thought felt like it was they never made it about the bottom line you know what i mean with me and to my face like they wanted the the shows to be the best pieces of art they could be first and then you know whatever happened with that stuff who knows what what is commercial and what isn't so i i, I had a great time so that, i think that was a surprise actually that like i had i felt as connected to bro commercial broadway producers as i did to you know my relationships with carol roth in the, at second stage or, or Bernie and, and Bobby and, and Will at, at MCC, etc. at people who run not-for-profits. And then I think the other thing that was like the most exciting for me was like this sort of mysterious truth, which is that a Broadway stage demands a different set of directorial parameters than, than an off-Broadway stage. And I mean that in terms of like what is powerful about staging on a Broadway stage is totally different than off-Broadway. What is that? I, I mean, I don't know if I can even articulate it, but it's, it is, they're just like these like very, very clear truths about like things like the golden mean and stuff like that. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like in, in sort of this geometric term that like, uh, it's sort of on a stage, it's, a, it's like the most powerful position on stage. It's about one third of the way on stage from the stage right proscenium is the most powerful position on stage. But like stuff like that, you know, I, I, that are that are, are sort of massively so and in Broadway. And like in, in an off-Broadway play, I could have gotten away with like being bold and having whole stage, a scene stage with my main character with his back to the audience, you know. I'm not sure that, that Broadway will allow you to do that. <laughs> I mean, you can literally, I mean, in a room of 700 to 1,000 people, you really, really can feel minute to minute, second to second when the audience is with you and when they when they are like, uh-uh, I'm, I'm thinking about something else. I've, I've, you've lost me. And I think that's really powerful. Both Stuart and Jeffrey are such great lovers of plays. I should also say having worked with them both, I'm not surprised that you had such wonderful experiences. With them. Did. You asked yourself a somewhat rhetorical question in there, I think, under your breath about what, what's commercial and yeah. who knows what's commercial and what isn't. Yeah. Have any idea? Me? I have no idea. No. Do you think about that? Like, will you think about that when you... 
I never think about that. I think it, I think as an artist, you can't. At least, at least, I, I'll speak for myself. I don't want to speak for all other theater makers, but I will speak for myself. I think if I thought about what was going to make money or what was not going to make money, I think all my choices would be cynical. And I, I think that's not where you make good art from. And I and I think like that's what I'm most interested in. And I think like you know, ultimately, whether it's in a 1500 seat house on Broadway or whether it's in a 89 seat house off off Broadway, I'm. Like as long as I'm making something that I really love and I really believe in, that's what I care. That's what I care about. Well, I'll also tell you that every time in my life, whether it's in the theater or not, I say to myself, "Ooh, I'm going to do this because it's going to make a lot of money." It never Doesn't. makes yeah. a lot of money. You're yeah. better off doing what you love and, and hoping something comes from that. I sure. think that's right. How do you? What do you think about the state of the? American play. Everyone, every couple of years, oh, there are no more great American playwrights, no more great American plays. How are we doing right now for someone who's on the front lines? Well, I think we're in an amazing period of writing in American theater. I think, let's go back to economics about it. Let, I, I, I'm going to say something rather controversial, which is that I think in order for plays to keep surviving on Broadway, I think that the theater owners need to charge less money than they do for musicals to rent a house. I think that's a very, very interesting thought, theater owners that are listening. (laughs) I think that they need plays to be on... I mean, we all need plays to be on Broadway. Otherwise, there is no such thing as Broadway versus off-Broadway, right? There won't be the Tony Awards. And I think it's an absolutely, ridiculously unfair thing to have a play try to stand up to a behemoth musical. I think that at the end of the day, you know, the times that we're living in, musicals make a gajillion dollars if they're hits, and a play will be lucky if it recoups, you know? And so... Make it less expensive for us to do them because we all need them to happen and, you know, we all want them to continue to happen. And I think in that way, you could also help stem the, the sort of bleeding of incredible, incredible talent from the theater to L.A. and, and they never come back. I, know I have so many friends who are like magnificent writers who probably will never write another play again because they're, they were, have been wooed to, to Hollywood. And, you know, g- God bless them. They're making, they're making an honest living now. And, and you can't as a, as a playwright necessarily. But, um, but I do think we're living in an amazing time for writing. There's so many good writers out there and there's so many good plays going on off Broadway. And I think the rules of what makes a play a Broadway play or not a Broadway play, I think, are ever shifting. And I think, like, you know, I think the fact that Lucas Nath was on Broadway last year was an amazing thing. Paula Vogel finally got on Broadway was an amazing thing. I think, you know, that Josh Harmon was on Broadway was an amazing thing. So I, I want more of that. Any young playwrights to watch? Anyone you've got your eye on? That... <laughs> so many. So, 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 so many. So many. But uh, I definitely would check out The Treasure at Playwrights Horizon, which is a play by Max Posner, who I've known since he was 18 years old. And now he's only just a little bit older than that, and a brilliant writer. All right, we're going to ask you my genie question now. Okay. I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you okay. and wants to thank you for your contributions to Broadway and off-Broadway by granting you one wish. Okay. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway or off-Broadway or the theater in general? Something that makes you so angry and so mad that you'd ask this genie to wish away. <laughs> the theater would therefore be a better place because of it. Wow. All right. There's so many things that make me angry. <laughs> but I'll choose one. How about this? Can we make it so that opening night parties are not on the same night that the reviews come out? Please. Can we allow a party to happen where we can celebrate the work that we have done and not be all stressed out about what two people are going to be saying about our work two people two people's opinion and then it will color the whole evening uh, either for good or for, for for worse but i think that it's wrong to tie s- some random critical evaluation of the play to a celebration of the work so funny this is another thing of course the internet has changed drastically because back in the day at least you had to wait till 4 a.m or so right. to read the paper and right have that was much party. more civilized right. exactly 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 do you read reviews so i Unfortunately, I have to say I do, and I think partly I do, because I don't want to, but I partly do because 99.9% of the writers that I work with don't. So in some ways, I read them so that I can protect them and engage with them in a way that they need to to be protected and engaged with once those reviews come out, for better or for worse. I feel like, you know, I'm sort of with their agents, let's say, the front lines against, use the word perceived failure or success. 
read chat boards, message boards? I do not do that. That's that's truly masochistic. <laughs> do you? I do not. Yeah. I used to be one of them oh, yeah. when I was 18 years old, and I remember how I was on those chat boards. So it's right. very easy for me to remember the passion. And listen, I love, I love them because they were, for me, an outlet for someone who lived far away from New York City, and it was a way for me to find people as passionate right. as I was. Sure, sure, But sure. that's a different thing, and I'm looking for different information yeah. nowadays. Basically, I just listen to people in my audience. Right. And with that, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks to all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Don't forget to go see Lobby Hero on Broadway this year, directed by Trip. Don't forget, you've only got a few more days left to get Getting the Band Back Together tickets for only 50 bucks. If you ever thought about seeing the show, this is the time to get it. You only got a few more days to do it. $50 tickets. Get them today. GettingTheBandBackTogether.com. <laughs> <laughs>